we're going to be doing it tomorrow. Was there any other advice? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I got. Yeah. All right. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, that's more I got started with this one. Oh, that's it. We're going to go ahead and uh, get into the updated population and municipal water and wastewater forecast. So I'm going to take you through the population numbers first, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the approach on the municipal wastewater uh, and water forecast. Again, we, we've all worked together, but I do want to just state, you know, I, I try to do, Shane and I both try to do the best we can to figure out a lot of technical information, but there are folks behind us that are doing a lot of technical work, and there are people that don't work for us that are doing a lot of technical work. So I'll just ask for your, uh, your indulgence, if you will, a little bit. If We don't have answers today. Um, our commitment, is, is, as always, is to get those answers to you, because sometimes the experts uh, have just given us the information. Um, when I was at the Altamaha, I was getting um, numbers the night of the meeting. So I, I did a little better. I was getting numbers uh, earlier this week. But, but bear with us, because the principle being, what we want to do is bring you information before it's set in concrete. And it's that, that partnership, I think, we formed where we try to give you the best information we have now, but recognize everything you see today. There might be some minor tweaks, but we feel we feel good about the information, good enough to share what we get today, but it uh, you know, certainly could be refined, and, and we will continue to do that as we as we finalize everything all the way up until, as Shane pointed out, really getting to the point of getting it into the plan form. So it's a living document, as, as we've always said. And again, I, uh, I just uh, applaud EPD uh, for, for embarking on this effort. Quite honestly, it's probably a little earlier than, than we might have. A five-year review is, is kind of soon. Um, because you know what? Are, how fast will those trends or those factors really change? Um, is five years a sufficient at time? Um, this is maybe a little earlier, but um, it's better to do it more frequently than less frequently. And as you're going to see, there have been some changes, and some changes that are we think are pretty significant. Um, and do also keep in mind the same as uh, the, what you'll see today. These will not necessarily be cast in stone either. I think we said often that our document, our plan is a living document, and we want to continue to be revisited and adapted uh, to, to what we're doing um, going forward. So with that, that um, disclaimer, I guess, in a little bit, um, we'll go ahead and, and go through. What the presentation today is going to be is I'll, through all the stuff I'm going to do for you, is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the who, who's doing it, the method, and then results. Um, if I'm giving you too much detail, let me know. If I'm giving you too little, um, let me know. And, the, and really, I should have done something before this slide, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up for a second, because I know if you're looking at that, you won't be listening to me if you're like me anyway. I can't listen to something and listen at the same time. So for every forecast you're going to hear today, for everything that we do, there's a real simple principle. You have a driver times a water use factor. So the math is super simple. Driver, water use factor equals uh, water use and forecast. So the driver, what's a driver? A driver is the thing that we try to get at to see how it's going to change over time. A driver, in the case of municipal water, is population. If population is growing times water use factor, how much per water that person uses equals the water today and then we grow that over time, so it's driver, water use factor equals forecast. Everything you'll hear is that, it just gets really complicated after that because the drivers and the water use factors get complicated. So when Cliff talks to you, I don't want to steal his thunder, he's going to be kind of telling the same thing. Driver, uh, an animal, pig, bee, chicken, times water use factor, and then how that is going to grow over time based on forecasted uh, uh, head counts or cap. Um, same thing for thermal electric energy. Driver times water use factor. So just keep that in mind because as I start showing you this stuff, it'll get all murky again. But it's actually really easy math. Um, it just gets complicated. We get the devil in the deep. Does that make sense to folks? Does that sound good? Um, 
So where do we get the drivers? Where do we get the population? It's going to be the same process we used last time. Remember, in fact, the Office of Planning and Budget was essentially established to help support the planning process around the first round. And they were just really coming up online as we started that um, original population work. Um, and uh, Georgia, the state of Georgia, developed that because they recognized the importance of really using those population numbers not only for water planning, but for a lot of purposes with state agencies for, for funding formulas, for transportation, education, other things like that. So, so that, that, that office is uh, situated in the governor's office. Um, it's used by the state agencies. And um, these updated populations that uh, projections that they've given to us um, are, are very dynamic. And it is really important to revisit those um, as we go through the planning process. And I'll talk to you about why they're dynamic, why they change so much, and, and why it's important to revisit them so quick. Hey, so, so can brief. I add something there real quick, Rick? So, <laughs> whatever, why does this always happen on the water plan? But um, this is the first time these updates are being shared really with the public, even though they're used to look at education and transportation and things like that. So. Like, as we're sitting here today, this is some of the first time that these population numbers have been put out in the public forum. Which is probably why I threw that disclaimer and why I don't have any hair, because I, I always seem to get the opportunity to put these things out in the public. And you'll remember there was a fair amount of hoopla during the last full of time. Once we started putting those numbers out there, you know, people got a little bit nervous. And got GCA folks were going, and we remember. Um, so, I kind of hit to you now, driver times water use factor. Now I want to get into that driver a little bit more. So what, how, do we, how do we deal with that, that driver? Um, future population equals our base year population. Um, oftentimes it's census data. So remember, we were at a little disadvantage, and this is a really important point. We were a little disadvantaged in a way when we started the water planning process, the census is done on a decadal basis. So every 10 years, you get really good census data. So in 2010, we had really good census data, really detailed uh, census counts, really good population counts. And then every year, as you get near towards the near that end of that decade, 2005, 2006, 2008, you're further away from that really detailed count. So you're relying more on that interdecadal projection. So near the end of the plan, we're kind of far, you know, we're a little ways through that decade. So we, um, I'll talk more about how that has affected the results. So now we're taking some of the information from the 2010 census, real life counts, using that as some of our base year population, and then we're applying births, additions to population, deaths, um, subtractions from population, and then net migration, people moving in, people moving out. And what you'll hear me talk a fair amount about now is, is, is kind of how did these variables change? How did this get updated through the 2010 census and just kind of see where we, where we landed? <coughs> but, but, but now that you know the math, let's now take a step back and say, um, how well did our last forecasting generally look? And then in the context of that, how does this ne next forecasting look? Uh, kind of going forward. So let's look back for a minute first. So looking back, to put this in more context, this is showing Georgia's historic population projections and actual count from 1900 to 2060. And I know these colors are a little bit hard for you to see, but I'll just walk you through this slide a little because it's, I think, a really valuable slide. you got years down here, you got population on the y-axis, and you can see it's at 5, 5 million, 10 million, 25 million um, increments. So you can see in the 1900s, Georgia population was around 2.5 million. Um, and then you see the black line here is the historic population, so it's the, the, the real population count. Then you have the round one population. The round one population meaning what we use in the round one of the plan. So what, what we use in our plan, what the state used was round one. And now what you're seeing is the first result of the updated population. So you can see that the updated population in green is much flat. It's showing a much slower rate of growth than was used in the round one population projection. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit and explain to you why I think that's happening. And I'm not a demographer, but I've been trying to figure it all out. Um, but what I really want you to focus on is which of those two lines 
more accurately reflects what historically George has always seen. The blue line or the green line? Which one, if you were to continue this graph and kind of put it in between place, would it be going more like that or more like that? So you can kind of see that, in fact, these updated population projections look to be a little more in line with what historic growth has always been. And, and why is that? Why might that have happened? Well, what was going on in, in Georgia from about 1990 to 2005? Rapid explosive population growth. Huge amounts of net migration into the area. A lot of young people moving in. And where was a lot of that population going? And so you really saw uh, that data shaping that blue line. Now it's a different story. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Well, why that story looks a little bit different. Um, but, but before I do that, even though those population projections are a little bit flatter, the key message here is that Georgia remains still a very fast growing state. So water will continue to be extremely important in terms of how we manage it and how we use it. Um, with Georgia having about 18 percent, you know, top 10 highest growing population states, about 18 percent growth, um, even during that 2000 to 2010 period, which was kind of began to be kind of part of the boom period. And what happened in 2007? The, the, you know, the recession, and so slowing down. So the 2000 to 2010 kind of ca captures a little bit of the boom and a little bit of the recession. And so this forecast kind of has a little bit of both of those elements in it. So, um, but again, Georgia being, um, you know, in terms of the population change, uh, ranking very high in terms of overall population change compared to all other states, uh, one of the top ten. Does that all make sense so far? Kind of set the set the foundation because now we're going to get into some results. Um, so. I'm zooming now into not the historical part, but where we are today and where we think we're going to be in the future. And I apologize, these lines are a little bit hard to see. The black is on the top and the, the lighter blue is on the bottom. And the round one is on the top and the updated is on the bottom. So you can see what I kind of described there, what is zoomed into it now. A little bit more flattening of the population and round one, uh, the population was projected, excuse me, the population at the time was a forecast, though it was 10 million. The updated actually has a census count, so it was actually a little lower census count um, than what was forecasted, but pretty darn close. So it was right in there. Doesn't, you know, it's easy to project something when you're only projecting for a couple of years. It's really the out years where you start seeing the differences more. So by 2060, in round one, the Georgia population was forecasted to project it to be a little over about 19.5 million plus, 19.69. Under the update, really 14.71. So a so pretty substantial shift down, but, but still significant growth from 9.5, 9.6 million to 14.7 So still, still significant growth. <coughs> So now let's look at our region. Um, this is aggregated for all of our counties here. Um, the, again, the same same layout. Round one is on the top. The updated up is on the bottom. Uh, and then the numbers, which may be a little hard for y'all to see, is in in round one, the two, 2010 forecast was uh, estimated to be about 403,000. The the uh, um, the update, which actually has census count in it, was 406,000. So pretty close, but, but not exact. Um, but then here you can see uh, this region, this Hill region, really mimicking a large part of what you're seeing statewide, uh, perhaps even more pronounced here, and I'm going to talk about why it's more pronounced, meaning that the effects of a slower growth rate are seen a little bit more here than you're seeing statewide, and I'll explain why I think that's happening. But again, the original forecast showing 650,000 by 2050, and under the revised forecast, about 500,000. So a pretty significant difference. And, and let's get into to, to why, if you like to think and we're seeing that. And, and just by the way, we do have this information county by county, but again, for purposes of today, we can certainly get that to y'all. We want to kind of stay region-wide today. The, the patterns you see county by county 
are pretty consistent. Some counties a little bit flatter in terms of their growth, uh, some a little bit more robust. And it's just intuitively just what you guys have experienced and are thinking. Um, some of the bigger city areas like Valdosta, Lowndes County, you know, a little bit more uh, steeper growth rates. Some of the more rural counties like Eccles, you know, maybe a little bit more flat in terms of it. But, but generally, you know, the pattern follows pretty closely along what you see here for most counties. <coughs> Questions so far? So let's get into some of the reasons we, we think. And, um, and, and I want to start with, um, the, to understand the reasons, we got to know the method a little bit more. You've heard this before, but a reminder. So the, uh, what they call a cohort component model was used for both round one and updated population projections. So there's no difference in terms of how we're approaching it. There's no difference in terms of the math that's being used. The inputs are changing. Um, so what is a cohort component method? Remember, what they do is they take people of similar cohorts, similar types of people, and they look at the characteristics of that group of people, and then they make predictions about how that group of people. Um, and I'll pick on Mike because he and I are about the same. So if you look at Mike and I as cohorts, because we're kind of getting pretty close to the same age and pretty close to the same hairstyle, so we're kind of similar cohorts. Um, and, and, and he and I, he and I talk a little bit different, but we behave pretty similarly. Um, Mike, are you thinking of having any more kids? Yeah. Yeah. Me, me neither. So we, they know by looking at us as a cohort, we're, we're probably not going to have any more kids. Um, now, you, you take somebody like Shane, he's a little bit younger, and, and he has a couple <laughs> kids, which maybe is why he might not have any more, but, but he is at least maybe more in a category where, where he's still on the fence a, a little bit on, on whether he would. So what they do do is they invite folks up like that based on their behavior. They kind of get their characteristics of, of what they're going to do. So that's what the cohort component method is. They take those categories of people, characterize them, and then they, they grow each of those categories or they estimate um, with their um, with their fertility and death rates are. So for each of those cohorts, you're either going to be somebody that's going to be more lean towards adding to the population or part of what maybe is, is taken away from the population. Um, so um, we had new data for that, 2008 to 2012. Um, that, that data um, came from um, health department information, Georgia specific, on, on those behaviors of those different cohorts. Um, so that part's the best, the, the most stable part of the forecast. The part that's the toughest to get a handle on, and that's more volatile in terms of what you see, is, is that the migration rates. So it's births over deaths and migration rates. So migration's tougher just because it's a little bit harder to predict what, where people are going to move and why they move and so on. Um, and there were a number of sources of data, but there's, this is the area where there's most uncertainty, and that's why it's so important to come back and, and recheck the forecast. But um, they, they looked at um, a couple different uh, documents, the Census Bureau's annual population estimates for components of change over a 1990-2014 period, and then they uh, looked more specifically at the 2006-2014 period to calculate net migration for the county in, in Georgia. And they also took data from this American Community Survey that just talks a little bit about how people move within areas. So, and, and they do a lot of more complex things than I'm familiar with when they combine those, but they put those also into a model to basically kind of predict where people are moving to. Um, and, and people move for different reasons. You remember, again, that going back to the boom period, why did Georgia grow so much um, employment? I mean, Georgia in the 1990s, 2000s was adding lots of jobs. Um, you know, perfect storm of a great economy, um, low housing prices, climate. I mean, it was a really desirable place, and people really flocked here for the, for the low, low cost of living and, and it's good job opportunities that were available. Um, so I, I kind of hit on this. I just want to make sure we capture it in our notes, because we'll get those posted on the web so people council members that aren't here, we can tell them, hey, if you missed the presentation, you can read, read some of it. So I've, I've hit number one. Um, I've hit number two. But now I want to talk a little bit about these trends. So 
Georgia, and Scott, you, you, you hit right on it, you know, the Georgia continues to grow, but the growth is trending towards fewer counties. 50% of Georgia's population growth from 2010 to 2013 occurred in three counties. So, I mean, y'all, I mean, that's just, when you step back, it's like, yeah, that, that's kind of what happened. Um, and on the other side of that equation, between that same period of time, the census showed uh, that about half of the Georgia counties that have, um, have experienced population growth. Okay, so growth is starting to concentrate more in fewer counties. Um, and in the counties where you saw population declines, there tended the majority of them tended to be more rural, rural counties. So again, nothing, nothing that I think is all surprising to y'all. And just a comment before I get to the next slide, it's a little more, more, more uh, um, <coughs> hard to, to visualize because there's a lot of colors on it. So with that in mind, when you do look at the county-specific data, um, and I'm going to use a county outside of this area because it's sometimes less emotional. When you think outside your region, it makes a little bit more sense because you can be a bit more objective. Um, one of the counties in the coastal region has a really I'll just say a really weird population, non uh trend. And, and I look at it and I'm like, well, that is such a strange trend. Why is it being declining? We originally thought it was really increasing. Why is it declining? Because it was seeing a lot of people come in um, in the 1990s and 2000s. Why, does, why did this happen? And it was really getting back to those cohorts and the migration. So what you had is a bunch of people moving into this coastal county in the 2000-2010 period, and they were mostly folks like Mike and I. They were there, so they had a lot of people coming in, <coughs> a lot of growth, um, but they they also didn't like that growth, so they kind of had a not a friendly growth um, policy. So their county local governments didn't want a lot of growth, so they were like, we don't want growth. So they had a lot of retirees, and they didn't want a lot of growth. So now, when you look at their demographics, they have a lot of people like Mike and I. Um, they're not having kids, and now as the as people that came in are aging and they're reaching the end of their life, their mortality rates are increasing. They don't have a young population. And you see now the effects of that over a 50 year period. So when you look at your results, you, you won't see anything as dramatic as that. Um, and I don't mean to be that mysterious. It's Macintosh County. It's the county I'm talking about um, in the coastal. So you'll see a few of your counties are a little bit more that way and other ones aren't. And, and, and in my mind, without over simplifying it, that, that's why. You know, it's just that's that age structure of people that live in those counties. And, and the young people um, that are being born into the county are, are, are tending to, to move away and have families in other places. And that's a generalization, clearly. But, um, and we just wanted to give you, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but we did want to just give you a little bit of a snapshot in, in terms of how well the round one projections actually met the census. And this is just in percent difference. So if we met the round one was exactly the same as, as the census, the number would be zero. Yeah, we, 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 we predicted it in 2010 to be X. And sure enough, when the census came out, it was in fact X. If it's red, it means that uh, the round one um, was different, it was lower than the census, and if it was green, it was higher than the census. So for our region, you can see, we aggregate those numbers up, but there's unique differences. That's why we really want to highlight this in, in, in this slide. Is, um, so some of those uh, areas, it was higher, and some of it was lower. It's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag, because each county is, is unique. And I, just, I guess I'll just use this as an opportunity to kind of preface what I'm going to say about water use. The hardest thing I think we do about planning is we're trying to say a lot of different things easily. And when you do that, you have a tendency to either overgeneralize or get too far into the details. So when you're looking at population and you're saying county-wise it's happening like this, excuse me, region-wise it's happening like this, but then when you look at the counties, it's like, well, every county is a little bit unique. Some are, some grew a little more, some didn't grow as much. And then not only that, um, then when you go within the county, the individual things that are going on within that county differ. So just keep in mind that regional and local planning are very, very different. They're complementary, we hope, but 
statewide planning shouldn't take the place of local planning. It should, at least in our view, and I think what we're trying to do in the planning process is to be complementary of those local processes and not make conflict with those local processes. So that, I'm going to kind of move on into now um, a little bit more of the, taking that population out and moving it into water, but I want to pause here because that, that, that was a lot of information. Anybody have any questions about population projections? Some of those are pretty interesting, I think. Um, I don't I don't know how Eccles County is going to get much smaller. I mean, there's 2,500 people living in Eccles County. They just had an all Yeah, did that fucking group. They got a tax, they, they only had one source of sales tax there, but that was that Jeepy store. That, until now, I guess they have another source. That's good. Well, it's being built. I just not, well, there you go. <laughs> I, I just noticed that they had, re, uh, had decreased in size of the population. Some of those are a little bit skewed too. I was telling Cliff, I mean, you see Tipton had a, was far off, and I, I just don't see uh, that going on as far as projection goes. I was just going to mention that Tur Turner County is projected to have the largest drop yeah. over the, the planning period, period and that's a uh, 42% uh, drop. The county with the largest population projected increase is going to be uh, Lanier. So I think it's about 51% uh, increase. Um, there were seven out of our 18 regional counties that, that dropped. Um, What's supposed to be dropping that? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, it really is. There's some some infrastructure over there. 51% <laughs> increase. I mean, I, 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 I'm trying to turn it and to drop 42%. But I, I think Lowndes Lound, County, of course, projected the increase of 47%. So seven counties projected to decline, and the rest basically projected to us. Brantley uh, is a 6% growth. Uh, Eccles was a minus 3% of the projected growth. get into the, the water side so what I want to do now is focus on the, the base year per capita water demand so again what we do for the water use factor is we determine kind of how much water that individual uses and we multiply that amount of water times the future population and we get our future need and then we break the per capita water down into whether you're served by municipalities or whether you're self-supplied so that we're going to get into both of those numbers and kind of talk about what we did originally in how we're approaching it now. So how we did it originally is, again, I'm showing you now the municipally supplied, and I use the word municipal, but it's publicly supplied water, even smaller systems. So it's not just big cities. It's, it's the public systems that are providing 15 or more people uh, taps on um, water. And then the self-supplied is folks that are on wells, um, individual wells. And so what we do is we look at both of those, and since those um, have different water use factors, that's why we separate. We want to take those water use factors, look at the percentage served by municipal, percentage served by individual well, and then we grow those based on the population for each of those um, different um, methods of water supply. On the municipal side, excuse me, you remember what we do is we take the base year municipal water withdrawals, uh, the USGS report or on the major foundational element of the original plan, that, uh, the 2005 water use uh, that was uh, authored by Fanning at all was a major component that we relied upon. For us, it wasn't the, the single component. Um, most councils relied most exclusively on that. If you remember, we spent a lot of time with that because we looked at that, that work, um, and that work relied a lot on EPD data. Um, but what we did is where we saw discrepancies, we went to two other data sources, if you guys will remember. So we did go to EPD's drinking water permits and some of the withdrawal permit information. 
And then we looked at statistically whether there was an outlier, and then we went and we looked at that outlier to see if there was a reason. Sometimes uh, it was just a matter of, uh, and, and our chairman asked me about this, and we remembered in Ben Hill with Fitzgerald, we had a large industrial user that had been captured in the USGS report that after we teased that data out a little bit more and reached out to Fitzgerald, they said, yeah, we have a large industrial provider. And we'd like to, with, we'd like to subtract that large industrial water using. Really want to emphasize this. Not a large industry, an industry that uses a lot of water. It could be a small industry, but if it uses a lot of water, we want to take it out of the base year water withdrawals of the city. So if you have a city that's providing a large industry water, we want to take that out. Why do we want to take that out? Um, because we don't grow industrial water use based on population. It doesn't have a relationship with population growth. It has a different relationship. And if you remember that, so that the driver for industrial water use is not population. It's production ideally, but industries don't give us production data. So I'm kind of foreshadowing a little of the industrial piece, but um, just realize that we grow that differently, so we take that out. Um, and then we look at by population and we get the gallons per capita per day. Um, for cell supply, just a reminder, we originally were going to use the 75 that the USGS had published in the Fanning report. After working with y'all um, and Greg in particular, um, and a couple other folks, um, there was a discussion that a lot of municipalities used a different unit for evaluating how much water uh, that is used by uh, their, their folks. So they use a equivalent factor. So they say, how many housing units do we have? How many people are in those housing units? And then they use 100 gallons per capita per day to then look at that utilities sometimes use that formula. Um, so you all adopted a, a little different number that reflects a little more locally the way some of the smaller utilities do appear. So that's why we, we deviated a little on that 100 based on the direction you guys gave us. Um, just a reminder, the, other, the math part of it, I think I've hit on everything else here. Uh, county, calculating a weighted average, weighted by population served for each county. So what we wanted to do is make sure we take into consideration if you are uh, a person that provides <coughs> water cup, a single person, and your gallons per capita per day is, I'm just being silly now, a thousand, your influence on the overall average shouldn't be the same as a city that serves a lot of people, um, 10,000 people. You weight that based on the amount of population served so that you get a uh, more accurate reflection of what the overall water use is. So that's still, everything is still the exact same as before. Um, but we've made a change um, to update that. So no deviation so far. What we did is we took the base year per capita and the future population. We felt that, is there anything we would do to update this? And you saw the update we just described on population. So how did we do a per capita adjustment factor? Um, did we really need to do one was the first question. And EPD looked at it and they said, yeah, probably need to. Um, whoops, sorry, what's wrong with And the reason that we probably need to, uh, it wasn't self-evident initially. They just said, well, let's go out and look and see if we can do it. And what they did is they went out and looked at water systems from 2010 to 2014, five years, and said, were there any changes that we need to worry about? And the answer was, not really anything to worry about, but, you know, we, we got better data, so let's, let's, uh, let's use it. Um, so what they did is they looked at a percent rate of change for those intervening uh, years and basically come up with an adjustment factor, and I'll show you those. So it's a really logical, streamlined, and pretty effective, in my opinion, approach, where you say, okay, if, if, um, if Mike was a municipal water provider, and in those intervening years, you're your rate of water usage went down by 2%, let's adjust our per capita by 2%. Very, very logical and, and pretty streamlined and easy to do. And then we had applied those adjustment factors to the round one projections. I hit on these. 
Um, so we're taking our, our new populations, that split between municipal public supply, and then um, the ratio of the publicly supplied and self-supplied um, for round one were, were maintained. We didn't really change that at all. We didn't see any trend information that would suggest we needed to do that. Um, so what, what did it tell us? Um, overall, pretty small relative to the change. This is on the water use side now. Less than 10% change across all counties. 11 of the 18 had less than a five gallons per capita per day change. Um, the regional average uh, in round one was 137 gallons per capita per day. Again, each county was unique. That's in our plan. Um, and the updated information is 135 gallons per capita per day. That's regionalized. Some went up, some went down, and I'll show you that in just a second. Um, but a really pretty small overall change of 1.4. Um, so. Rick, let me apply that over the entire uh, plan. Future projections? Yeah, let's, let, let me show you this, Tom. That's a great question. Because um, this will give you a better sense of what it really looks like. And again, we'll get you better graphics over time, but to Tom's point, how will this then be applied? And this is how we'll apply it. So we're taking uh, the county is on the far left. The next column is your round one GPCDs for each individual county now. So that those, as you average those up, it came up with that 137. I remember, right? Then the updated GPCDs, then we have the change, and then we have the percent change. So you can see there those statistics I kind of rolled up for you. You can see individually um, some counties went up, some counties went down, and some counties remained the same. And where there was no water use data, like that goals, the same number was just carried forward. I guess my point is there has been as a result of water council recommendation. Uh, all apartment buildings now have individual water meters. Yes. Instead. So there are continuing to be things that will continue to reduce water usage going forward. And the, the trend in per capita water usage should be down. Yeah. Not, not flat. I yes. Think, I think you see that on that slide to Rick's point. The places that, that the data has gotten better it's showing it's going down. The places that it haven't gotten better, it's probably because the data is not very good. Uh, like Eccles carrying forward is a zero, but if you look at places like, I mean, Lounge is probably doing a better job keeping up. And because we're now putting meters, or we used to just make an assumption about those water places that that really impacts where more of those kind of people live. Your uh, reduction is going up. And, and Tom, you've hit on, you know, I'm kind of trying to keep the mass simple. Um, so I don't want to go too far into this unless council really wants me to. But Tom's exactly right. Remember what we did. There's two parts to Tom's question, if I'm hearing him right. One is, wouldn't we expect to see overall water use kind of decline over time as a result of BMP, best management practices? Um, and our forecast does that to a point. If you remember, what we do is we, last time we, we embedded into the forecast conservation we call it passive conservation, meaning it's conservation that's going to occur without anybody doing anything actively. And it's going to occur because of mostly the mandating of low flow water fixtures. So you remember we talked about the 1992 Energy Policy Act that mandated low flush toilets and then Georgia legislation that has, uh, I think it's ultra low, ultra high, high efficiency toilets. And so what we do is we have adjusted the water use over time by <coughs> looking at the rate of replacement of those fixtures as a passive conservation adjustment. But, but Tom's other point is something we haven't completely done is that what about, what about more sophisticated conservation measures such <coughs> as, as metering of single individual meters for multifamily residences? Because um, that usually does result in lower water use. Um, since there's no rule statewide or countywide to do that, we don't adjust that. What we do is we carry that forward as part of the management practice if we, if we want to recommend that to folks. So I, and council had some recommendations on, on metering and conservation for that. So, and we'll, believe me, we'll, as we get back to revisiting our management practice with Tom's point, we'll, we'll get into looking at that a little bit more. Um, 
But I always say it's also really important to step back when you're looking at all this stuff and say, okay, what does it really mean for the region? And, and I mean, this is very important data, and we need to be consistent across all counties, across the state, so we have apples to apples. For our region, what does it mean? Most all of our municipal water supply and cell supply is provided from groundwater. And right now, we'll find some wood number. Right now, and we'll see, but right now, our uh, resource assessments show pretty good groundwater availability. So as we look at population, look at these numbers, what are the practical implications for the region? Um, no, no red flags yet, no yellow flags yet that we're seeing based on, on what we're seeing here. Um, that won't be the case necessarily for, for all the planning regions. So, um, but to our original vision goals, just because we're doing good doesn't mean we can't do better. And revisiting are we wisely sustainable managing the resources. So um, enough pontification on my part. So just now, I want to combine those numbers. So I want to go back to population, just remind you, uh, new population numbers show lower growth. Now I'm going to take the population and combine it with those tables that you just saw and show you some aggregated numbers for that. Um, so this is now showing you the water. So it's got population and water now together. So the new numbers on the bottom are, are, are the, excuse me, the numbers on the bottom are not new, it's just the years out, but the numbers on the y-axis have changed. They're now in million gallons per day. So we've taken the population times the GPCD, million gallons per day, and we're showing it region-wide, and we're showing you just a comparison between the round one in gray and the updated in kind of the, that's kind of a yellow-brown color. Um, so again, some growth, but, but a more modest level of growth. Um, Nothing really unusual uh, jumping out in terms of what we see so far. And we'll have, of course, this done for county by county, um, so we'll get that all into our documentation, uh, like the technical supplemental documents we did for y'all last time. So um, are we done? Pro not quite yet. Um, EPD will continue to evaluate and refine additional sources of information. So we've got the GPCDs. We've been looking at, is that the um, best way to do the updated information? And so far, we're feeling really good about it. Um, but there is some additional data that we can get um, from other water use uh, information. And we want to just look at that and see if looking at that water use information interdifferently would change any of our conclusions. So the message there is we're still doing a little bit more work on that. Um, the reason we're doing that is that inevitably when you're trying to do regional planning, there are people at the local level that say, well, I don't do it that way. So you kind of want to look at, well, how are you doing it? Why are you doing it that way? Does the way we're doing it causing any problems for you? And vice versa. So that's why EPD is trying to be really responsive for that. So bear with us. We're still looking at some, uh, some additional data on that. Um, EPD has done a preliminary calculation of what that might look like on a region-wide basis. And I didn't put it up here because it's still kind of preliminary on this other data source. And um, sure as anything, Shane, I think I forgot that number. Is it one? Where is it? Yeah, you might be able to pull that. Uh, no, 144. 144. 144. Thank you. So, interestingly, this other data source, these other data sources that EPD is looking at is actually showing maybe a little bit higher GPC. So that's why they're kind of looking at, you know, why are we seeing that versus why are we seeing it from the, the method that we used in round one and kind of updated. So, so just more, more to come on that is the message. Uh, again, the practical implications of that, I don't, don't really see anything. Um, but we should know more. I think uh, we're, Cliff, if I'm remembering right, they're saying probably 30 to 60 days to kind of keep looking at that, do some outreach. So yeah. by the time we see you again, and we'll email you, if we see anything that says, hey, what we talked about today is, is uh, maybe going to change, we'll let you know. But I think it's safe to say, unless you hear from us, what you've seen today is, is I think, the way we're going to land. But we will definitely keep going. So I know this is a lot 
coming at you. So again, I want to stop here before we get into wastewater and just make sure everybody's feeling that the pace is okay. The detail is probably a little boring. I apologize, but um, is everybody okay with what's been presented? It, it, it's kind of interesting to me. I, I don't know how you guys felt, but I felt like when we got that data with those sharp curves in there a few years ago, we were like. Uh, had our hair on fire a little bit about like, what are we going to do about all this water usage? And now, you, when you look at it, it's, it's a little bit um, more predictable, I think. And so you can make decisions as a group. We can make decisions that uh, into the future. When you look at a growth like we were forecast that we looked at, and then you can figure that our water plants until 2013, uh, 2030. And you think, well, we get that kind of growth. What in the world are we going to do in 2025? I mean, I, I know that's, I thought about that. I'm not necessarily dwelling on it, but if those growths continue, to they were projected. Uh, there's not much work we can do to, to save much water. But looking at it like it is now, it's um, it's a it's a nice, easy trend, like it should be. I think um, I think we're pretty much all questioned those forecasts. <coughs> So, <laughs> it ended up in drastically overestimating. Because uh, it had everybody a little bit panicked. You know, that's the reason why a lot of stuff was coming down and, and uh, you know, the water was full in places. Do you want to take a break for lunch and then let yeah. Rick present this during lunch? Is that okay if we eat and yeah. star brick and let him do his wastewater? We'll talk about no, sewage no. while we eat lunch. That's great. That's great. And then, and let me just. That's perfect, Scott. I just want to not jump ahead of where we're going, but for you guys, just always remind you, help us make sure it makes sense to you and help us step, step back from all the math and think about the implications of folks uh, like y'all that are out there in your communities. Um, so if I were to say, what might this mean to people? I don't see anything that really bothers me except for maybe one thing. And I stopped when I went to Bryan County near the end of the last planning session. And when I went to that, I went to them to talk about saltwater intrusion. And they couldn't have cared less about saltwater intrusion, which is a huge issue. So why did, couldn't they hear a word that was coming out of my mouth? Probably because I'm boring, but um, they were going through their budget. And they were looking at the impact of property taxes on their county budget. And they were looking at their ability to pay their county employees. So what does a declining forecast mean to us? Well, not to worry so much about the resources, but we've got aging infrastructure, and potentially a lower tax base now. So our message to be thinking about as we reach out to our individual providers are uh, your water and sewer fees, and your fee structure, and how you invest in your capital on investment projects, you know, really have to sharpen your pencils. And the sooner you start trying to do that, the sooner you start looking at rates. Nobody likes high, high rates, don't get me wrong. But I guess that, you know, that's maybe a little different message, one that we, we didn't really, with boom and growth, you don't think about that. Kind of message. You know, so that, that's a word that's maybe speculated now. But, uh, maybe. Well, and what I would add to that is, again, I, maybe I sound like a, I'm being a dead horse here. It is a credit again to the state of Georgia for taking a chance to update these every five years because, you know, when you get the original plan, everybody thought it was going to grow like this. And now we're like, well, maybe it's somewhere in between. And the other point, and I, you know, I look at someone like Henry, who, who runs the utility there in Um, You know, that period of time, you were probably ramping up for some serious, you know, capital development as far as on your infrastructure side. And you know, a lot of the utilities really kind of thankfully said, "Wow, I'm glad you know that it didn't come because it gave me some time to maybe plan it out and." and Maybe not impact rates as much. So. You know, more along what Rick's talking about, the devil's advocate of that is if you did invest in that infrastructure and you got a declining population now, you're going to have to really take a close look at your rates. Yeah, Happy Ham County. Yeah, imagine yeah. if we had only done an update 20 years, you know, we yeah. were working off of those Our projections. Control. Yeah. Very good. All right, well, thank you for your attention. You Let's take a quick break. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to eat. Can I take a break before we eat? Uh, no problem with that. Yeah, and, I, and, and 
We got enough for the uh, absolutely. We got enough for everybody in yes, the sir. peanut gallery <laughs> to eat as well. Uh, and Michael, say grace, and then we'll go over here and, and you can get your plate and you're going to continue while we eat if that's okay with everybody. So I know it's probably not all right for Rick. He'll be the only one not it's eating. Totally good. But we'll try to keep going. We're a little bit behind schedule, so we'll uh, we'll do that. Okay. Get it, Mike. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Pray that you'll be with all the board members and the guests that's coming to this meeting. Pray that you'll guide us in our meeting. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless this food for nourishing our body, our body for your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.